invite you to pray with me. Loving God, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, into our lives and into this world. And we pray that you would help us to greet the coming of Jesus the way his mother Mary did, by saying, here we are, your servants. Let it be done for us according to your will. This we ask through Christ our Savior. Amen. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. With those words, I, Gabriel, began the most amazing ambition of my angelic career. Now it would seem strange on the surface that with all of the tasks that I have carried out on behalf of God Almighty, that this one, this seemingly ordinary day, would stand out. After all, I was the one who was sent to help the prophet Daniel understand his visions by the rivers of Babylon. And I was sent to the temple to announce God's blessing upon an old priest and his barren wife, along with many, many other important tasks that were never written down. But from the moment that I was sent to this ordinary house in the town of Nazareth, I knew that there was something different about this visit. Something that would stick with me for the rest of my days. When I first spoke to Mary, the confusion was written all over her face. Now, as an angel, I'm used to getting strange looks when I'm greeted by mortals. After all, it's not every day that one sees a divine messenger from God. But generally, the looks that I receive are sprinkled with more fear than confusion. We get fear often, so often on our visits to mortals, that when we angels get together in heaven and uh, talk to one another, we give each other advice on how to overcome the fears of the mortals. Well, most of us participate in the advice giving. Uh, St. Michael the Archangel kind of likes seeing the fear on the faces of mortals, and so he laughs at us when we try to tell each other how to quell the fears, but he was always a little bit different than the rest of us. But as I greeted that young woman in Nazareth, it seemed to me that shock and deep wonder displaced the expected fear. Luke would later describe my visit by saying that Mary was perplexed by my words and pondered what sort of greeting I had given. I suppose this is a good description because she seemed to me to be very deep in thought. Knowing that this was an important task, after all, it would be the only time that an angel would get to tell the mother of the Messiah about what God was calling her to do. I had rehearsed my speech many times in my room in front of the mirror in the week leading up to my visit. You could say that I was nervous or on edge. I wanted to get this right. I didn't want to mess up. But in each of my practice sessions, as I imagined that speech, I expected that Mary would be afraid and doubtful. After all, the first thing that each of my angelic colleagues say when they appear to mortals is, do not be afraid. I had to get this right. It just wouldn't do for the mother of our Lord to be mute until he was born because I had messed up again. You laugh, but it happened on another visit, not six months before, when I was sent to the temple to tell an old priest that his previously barren wife would give birth to the messenger 
who would go before our Lord. I confess that this was all partially my fault. I lost my temper with Zachariah when he demanded a sign. I don't know if it was frustration that he did not believe me. After all, he was a priest and should have understood the ways of God. Or maybe I was on edge because of my surroundings. After all, it's not every day that an angel gets to go into the inner sanctuary of the temple. But whatever the reason, and God was nice enough not to make me explain myself when I got back to heaven, I lost my cool with Zechariah. God was patient with me, but I suspect that he would have been a little less accepting of me making Mary's situation even more difficult than it already was. Having prepared for the fear and the doubt, I was surprised when Mary, a teenage girl, greeted me with deep contemplation. I would have assumed that the more experienced priest would have been more likely to first consider my words. But I had learned my lesson about assuming things. Still expecting that there was some fear there, I collected my thoughts and got to the point. I told Mary not to be afraid, for she had found favor with God. And looking back, I don't know if it was my nerves getting the best of me, or if there was some unexpected bout of wisdom. But I did not give Mary a chance to respond before I got most of my message out. I plowed right along with the speech that I had rehearsed and practiced so many times, telling Mary that she would conceive in her womb and bear a son, a son that she would name Jesus. Mary probably wondered how it was that she would be doing the naming after all, at that time, it was the father who gave the name to a child. I knew that because when I struck Zachariah mute, I made it so that he would not be able to speak until he had named his son John. Have I mentioned that that was not exactly my best moment? As I continued with Mary, I did not give her much of an opportunity to question the mechanics of everything. I had more important things to impart, and I was not going to stop talking until I got it all out. I said to her that Jesus would be great, it would be called the Son of the Most High, and that he would ascend to the throne of his ancestor David. Now, of course, I left out the part about how Joseph, and Mary's betrothed, would receive the news. One of my angel colleagues had been assigned to appear to Joseph in a series of dreams. And so I made sure not to mess up the plans by giving them away ahead of time. I would let my colleague deal with Joseph. I was sticking to the task that God had given to me to go and speak to Mary. I ended my rehearsed speech by telling Mary that there would be no end to her son's reign over the house of Jacob. The longer I spoke and the more I looked into Mary's eyes, I could see a look of deep reflection and contemplation on her face. I don't know if her mind ever got to Joseph and how he would deal with all of this. And she certainly didn't say anything about what I t told her who this child would be. After a long pause, Mary asked me how all of this could be, since she was a virgin. Now maybe this was the easiest thing for her to ask about, because she never bothered to ask how a lower class girl from the backwater village of Nazareth could give birth to the king of kings. And looking back on her question, I wonder if her mind had stopped working at the words, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. If it took her a while for the rest of what I said to sink in. Having prepared for a question like this, I kept my cool this time. 
I calmly explained to Mary that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and overpower the limits of basic biology. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, Mary's child would be called the Son of God. I must have had my visit with Zachariah on my mind because I quickly used Mary's cousin Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, as an example of God's ability to overcome the limits of what would later come to be known as medical science. After I told Mary that nothing would be impossible for God, it seemed like something clicked in her mind and her heart. The confusion and uncertainty were still there, but little by little they were being replaced by something far more powerful. I have never seen such deep faith in anyone else. Not in prophet, nor priest, nor ordinary person, as I saw that day that I visited Mary. As trust drowned out the confusion, Mary looked at me, and with deep conviction in her eyes, she said to me, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. While Mary may have been the one who was confused when I arrived, I left that visit feeling every bit as shocked and perplexed as she was when I first showed up. I was expecting to have to do much more convincing. Maybe it was the naivete of youth. Maybe it was a deep faith in God that I could not yet appreciate. Maybe it was all of these things and so much more. But Mary deeply impressed me that day. In hindsight, I'm glad that I was patient enough to allow her the space to work through her confusion so that her trust could take root. Now, my work in the Christmas story was not yet finished when I left Mary's house in Nazareth that day. I was among the angels sent to the shepherds in Bethlehem, and from heaven I quietly observed Mary's continued response to the message that I had delivered on behalf of God. Throughout all of the challenges, from her uncertainty about Joseph's response, to her seeking the counsel of Elizabeth, her elder cousin, to the journey to Bethlehem, to the dedication of Jesus in the temple, Mary's faith and trust in God grew with each new event that she treasured and pondered in her heart. It was almost as if each of these experiences showed her again and again that God would come through for her. As I remember those times, I continue to be inspired by Mary's faith and witness. As she day by day came to greater acceptance of what God was doing, and in the process of greater faith and trust in God, Mary became a heroine of our shared faith to me. I pray that in hearing my memories of that joyous and nerve-wracking visit all those years ago, that you too will consider the example of Mary as you move to acceptance and trust in what God is doing through Jesus the Savior. I was privileged to be allowed to participate in the coming of Jesus into this world, to have my own memories of those shared experiences. And you too have the opportunity to participate in welcoming Jesus into this world. You can participate in welcoming Jesus into this world by welcoming into your, Him into your heart and your life with trust and acceptance. You can participate in welcoming Jesus into this world by shining His light everywhere you go and everyone you meet. And you can participate in welcoming Jesus into this world by, like Mary, 
little by little allowing trust and acceptance to displace doubt and fear. So that Christ may dwell fully and richly in your heart and in your mind. Until that day that he returns again. Fulfilling all of the promises that God sent me and my colleagues to share with human beings.